this always happens. I'm always on mute <laughs> when I start. And Welcome. just like that, we're broadcasting to people from literally around the planet. Yes. Welcome this everyone. Planet, as far this as we whole know. whole planet. Uh, welcome to the first of our 30-minute mentor event series, where we'll be chatting about optimizing your first draft. I'm Megan Ross, Student Sparks Head of Creator Success, and I'm joined by our founder and CEO. I don't know if I'm pointing the right way. This way? Uh, Emily this Best. Way. <laughs> I also want to introduce and thank today's ASL interpreter from the sign language company, Gabe Gomez, for helping us make this event more accessible. And before we th kick things off, we'd like to acknowledge the land we are all on is occupied territory. I'm coming to you from the land originally belonging to Jumanos, Tunkawa, Coahuitacan, and Comanche, uh, also known, uh, known as Very Gentrified Austin. And now I'll kick it over to Emily to talk more about our guest of the half hour. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, my top, because some of you are curious, is made by a badass woman-owned company called New Works. I highly recommend you check them all out. It washes well, it wears well, I love it. Um, I'm so excited today and uh, I actually really want the opportunity to bring Mark on right now so that I can tell this story in front of him. Mark Duplass! What's up, guys? <laughs> um, so, Mark, uh, I just want to quickly tell everyone the story because we, in addition to launching the 30-Minute Mentorship Series, two other really important things have happened uh, at, at Seed and Spark in the last 24 hours. And the first is... We have eliminated our platform fees for crowdfunding. So like the old, like uh, tired was uh, platforms taking 5% of platform fees and wired, now I'm telling you how old I am, uh, <laughs> is eliminating platform fees, moving to a tipping model. The backers can decide if they want to support our mission, but more money stays in the pockets of filmmakers. The second thing that we are launching today um, is the patron circle. So I just want to tell the story of how this happened, which is um, Megan and her team had done some incredible work uh, in listening to the creators in our community. They do surveys, they do regular listening sessions, we're teaching workshops all the time, we're assimilating the feedback. Um, and that team had really come forward and said, y'all, creators are kind of sick of the universe of virtual events and uh, like whatever, and they just need some inspiration and they also just need cash to get this work done. Like that's what they actually need <laughs> yeah. right now. And this got me thinking about something that um, we had talked about over the years at Seed and Spark, which is um, could we get folks who've done really well <laughs> to potentially put some money down at the top of the year that they would spend down against crowdfunding projects throughout the year. And because we're so good at surfacing all these incredible voices from all over the country and now all over the world, um, could we help surface for them projects they might not otherwise discover that they really want to support? And so I called the person I call when I want to spitball ideas like this, and that's Mark Duplass. And he picked up the phone because he's the best. I don't know how he has time, but he does. And I was like, Mark, we're thinking about doing this thing. And he was like, yes, I love it. I'll do it. How much do you need? When do you want? Who can I call for you? And I was like, oh, I guess we're doing this. I guess this is going to become a thing. So he, I, like, I was like, I'll be back to you tomorrow with those details. Um, and I, I like circled up with the team, put together kind of an introductory email and sent it to Mark. And Mark sent it to, if I have to be honest, uh, like within 24 hours, I was being introduced to like some of my heroes uh, along the way. And some of them signed up for uh, to become patrons. And so it was really Mark's energy and spirit that gave birth to what is a pilot program. So we're testing a lot of things this year of the patron circle of which Mark is part of the founding circle. You'll hear from Jason Reitman next week. He's a part of the founding circle. You'll hear from Sylvia Zachary from Mamag Studios. Um, so a lot of the mentors that we're lining up are also patrons who've signed up to directly support projects um, on our crowdfunding platform throughout the first half of this year. And then from there, we're gonna learn and improve and make it even better and bigger and cooler next year. Um, and I tell that story because like, I can already tell that what's happening in the comments is like the global collection of the Mark Duplass fan club. And I don't think people truly understand the like spirit and energy that you bring behind the scenes that like 
like is the wind under the uh, wings of like a lot of folks like us out there. It's like he is in many places. He's supporting many, many amazing artists. If you haven't watched somebody somewhere, you should do that. Um, that's just like one tiny example. So um, that's my way of introducing Mark Duplass, uh, general uh, energetic wizard of the independent film space. Emily, you're my new therapist. I don't need to go to therapy anymore because I have you. You made me feel so good. Um, thank you for doing everything that you do. I love being your partner in this stuff. It's so fun. Thanks. It um, fun. It's, it's the best. And uh, let's talk about some screenwriting stuff, shall we? Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. So I'm gonna, it. we're going to chat with Emily and Mark first, and then we'll bring on our creators later. But before love we bring it. them on, I want to know, Mark, what drew you to choose this topic to discuss today? I feel like screenwriting is uh, one of the hardest parts uh, of the trade. And it is, I think if you talk to filmmakers, the thing that people are most scared by um, and they hate the most. And I have found it odd when I'm in conversation with screenwriters, when I talk about how much I really enjoy the writing process and they, they go, what's, what's wrong with you? Um, it's terrible. And, and so it got me thinking like, well, what have I cultivated that have made this actually into an enjoyable, fruitful process for me? Um, and so I was like, I want to kind of walk through some nuts and bolts stuff for people if they're interested in hearing it, you know, like less theoretical and more just like useful shit. Mm -hmm. And how would you say your approach to a first draft, first draft has changed since your early days, starting out as a screenwriter to today yes. when you have Drastic. a lot more people breathing down your neck? It's, dra your it's drastically <laughs> different. It's drastically different, but, but mostly in a good way. Um, so, you know, I really believed in, in sort of the uh, artistry of creativity and the muse comes to you and you just need to like sit there and, and let it come. Um, and then I believed in starting to write scenes without a structure and letting that guide me. Um, and that can be a very successful way to write. And I want to be clear that what I'm about to advocate is one that works for me. Um, and it doesn't mean it's the only way, but I'm just going to give you an example that works for me, who is a highly anxious highly depressive uh, person in danger of spiraling down the creative wormhole. Um, and so I need to have rails for myself and I need to have structure in order to put the creativity to work. And it has worked for me and it makes me like the process. Um, so not to get all like Tony Robbins up in here, but I'm going to like give you some stuff here. Okay. Um, what I do now um, is I think about the story that I want to make for a little while before I put any pen to paper. I think about the themes. I think about does it matter in the world? Does it have a place in the world? And then once I am pretty sure that this is something I want to write, um, I come up with what I think are anywhere from like two to four movies that I think um, are comparables to the movie that I want to make. Okay. Sometimes I've already seen those movies. Here's a really critical part of the process. Watch those movies 20 times and embed the structure of those movies into your DNA so that when you are drawing upon them as an influence, they're not coming from your brain, which is a terrible place to come from when you're scared, panicked, insecure. They're actually coming from inside of you in the DNA. Like I saw Karate Kid in the movie theater 50 times when I was eight years old. I know how to write a sports movie because of that. Um, and I allow myself to be, quote unquote, derivative and quote unquote, stock of those plot points in those movies, because I know that ultimately the way that I write my characters, the way that I write my own story turns are going to differentiate it and make it different. But I forgive myself up front from being uh, derivative and I don't pressure myself to reinvent the plot wheel or reinvent anything. This allows me to move with speed and courage and not hate myself while I'm writing. So the next step after I've kind of got my comps down is again, I don't put any pen to paper for actual script form until I've made an outline. Outlines are a controversial thing, whether they're good for you because they provide rails or are they bad for you because they might stifle some creativity and some new scenes that you might have found by just swimming in the sea of infinite possibility. I have a very strong feeling swimming in the sea of infinite possibility is fun. Maybe once, but if you want to become a career screenwriter, it's torture and it's why most people hate writing. So I highly recommend you come up with a structure for your movie. It does not have to be the ultimate structure for your movie, but come up with those. If you're making a micro budget movie, 10 to 15 scenes kind of 
longer scenes, less scenes, so that you can ultimately make your movie. If you have more money for your movie, do more scenes. But come up with what you think is the proper amount of scenes for your feature film. Um, and don't kill yourself over this. Again, this is not your last crack at this thing. So once you get to, in my opinion, the 80, 90% success rate of this, and you're feeling like, I think I got a shot to write this movie, this comes the most important part of the process, which is the vomit draft. And I've talked a lot about the vomit draft in the past, but I think this is where most people get in their way is that you're sitting there typing on your computer, you're writing dialogue, you're looking at it as you're writing it and you're entering self-loathing mode and you're losing all of your confidence because you're thinking, God, that's not unique. God, that's stock. That's terrible. So for my early screenplays, I avoided the self-loathing of the vomit draft by taking a handheld dictaphone and speaking the, the script into the dictaphone, recording it. This way, if it's a nonlinear tape, you can't go back. You can't edit yourself and you can't see what you have done and you can't criticize yourself. And I literally get up and walk around and I don't sit in the chair where you can kind of like mired and get stuck in snacks and get stuck in lethargy. Like go out, walk around, see things in the world, inspire yourself and try to speak out that draft very quickly. Anywhere from two to five days, I would recommend if you've got your structure. Then transcribe that thing into the computer, into your final draft, whatever you're using. While you're transcribing it, you'll probably find yourself editing it. You probably feel like, oh, that wasn't so great. You can pause. So you're going to get a, like a little mini draft 1.1 on the way into the computer. Get it in there. Take a couple of days. Take a break. Read that thing. What you're probably going to find, at least in my case, is you're going to have some characters whose voices may not be as distinct as they should be because you spoke them, right? And you did it quickly. You're probably going to find some maybe stock plotting devices leaning too heavily upon the movies that you comped watching it that aren't unique enough. You'll criticize that a little bit. Um, your screen direction is going to be the least poetic and well-written prose you've ever come across. It can easily be fixed when the other set of your mind. But what you're going to get is impeccable pacing because you wrote it fast and you didn't get lost in the sea of infinite possibility. This is the number one most important thing to screenwriting is getting that pacing down. When you move so quickly, your body knows because you watch those movies, you've done your homework. I just did a really fast scene where someone was chasing somebody with a knife. It's now time for them to sit in the car, chill out and breathe and have the slow, quiet scene where they talk about their daddy issues, whatever it is. It's like pacing a record and you know, fast song, medium tempo song, slow song, really fast song. And the only way that I can get that is if I move so quickly that my body is pacing it ahead of my mind. And so you take that draft, great pacing, lame characters, some stock plotting, some derivative stuff. Then you click over from that wild creative side of your brain into the editorial side of your brain. And, and then that's the easy part. You, you go use that little film school part of yourself or you know the film scholar in you, I should say. Um, and you start picking it apart and you start sharing it with your friends and you get them to give their feedback to you and that's basically, in a nutshell, kind of how I get through that first thing within a month or so without torturing myself. Um, and more importantly, I would say, you know, leaving something on the field so that so that you're excited to show up next time. Because I find that most writers I know, they hate the writing process so much, they're sort of loath to come back. So, you know, that's the that's the process. And and I heard something the other day, it's, it sounds really corny, but it's really been sticking with me um, in terms of watching a lot of movies, the movies that you feel that are like you, watching them multiple times and doing the research and the work to study those. And honestly, I do believe in reading the screenwriting books and learning those rules and tricks of the trade to give you the rails. Um, the expression I heard is when times are tough and when push comes to shove, we don't actually rise to the occasion we fall to the level of our training and we hope we can make it through from there. And I really believe in that. And that is, you know, again, that research of reading the books, that research of constantly watching movies, rewatching the movies that feel like you, because your head continuously gets in the way and makes you drown in self doubt. And the more you can lead from your spirit and your gut, in my experience, the better you'll be. Wow. I feel I feel like I just did like a screenwriter's intensive. I've never heard of anyone giving advice to uh, actually recite that first draft. 
And now I'm in. Yeah, I don't have to do it anymore. Sorry to interrupt, but I don't have to do it anymore now because after I did that like three times, like now I know I'm eventually going to get through it. Mm -hmm. So even when I am doubting myself and looking at the screen, I have another louder voice in me that's like, yeah, this sucks, but you're going to be okay and you're going to be fine. But I needed it to break through. So part of what you're talking about are like the early ways to train yourself to love the writing process or at least trust yourself enough to know that you can get through it. This is like a, these are incredible mental tricks to have in your back pocket so that you keep going. Cause I do think the, it is so easy to run away from it and say, Oh, I don't want to go back. It's Um, the hardest thing of all my peers, of all my friends, you know, in this whole process, you know, you know, musicians, directors, editors, you know, they always have a place they can pick up from the writer and the, and the empty page is the scariest thing. And the first draft is the toughest, you know? So you really have to like build these, this little arsenal of tools for yourself to trick yourself through it. Yeah. I like this. I like writing. I, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> exactly. I love it. Like, it's the fun. Like, this is the what I'm meant to be Isn't doing. Isn't it best? Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd love to hear from both of you. What's the most ridiculous thing you've done to procrastinate from starting that first draft? at any point in your careers? That's such a good question. Um, Have a baby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. a nine month procrastination. Wow. I yeah, mean, it's all going, to be perfectly yeah. honest. Like still haven't come back to it. So. <laughs> yeah, I love that. You know, it's funny, like when you bring that up for me, like uh, I'll just say this because the truth is I I don't actually procrastinate on the first draft that much. What I procrastinate on is the rewrites. I'm I'm terribly afraid of rewrites. I'm terribly afraid of ruining the architecture of what I've built. Yeah. And so mm-hmm. I've learned in the process that I need a partner that I can sort of hand the baton off to. Um, so I'm very confident and skilled at writing a a B to B minus first draft that can then be elevated with someone else who's really smart and good at the uh, micromanaging precision work of that. Um, And so I've gone beyond just procrastinating on the second draft. Like I send my first draft out to five really strong collaborators and, and, and really get their help. And then sometimes I give it away to that, to someone else and share the credit with them to, Mm. to help me take it to another notch. And that's, you know, that's, part of my process as a filmmaker too is someone who likes to do a little bit of everything from acting producing writing directing learning what my superpowers are and without ego being honest about them owning them like i'm I'm really good at that first draft i'm Mm. terrible at drafts two and three and i need jay and i need mel who run my company and i need my smart people around me you know i'm and and now that i've sort of learned those things about myself and i'm honest i do those things that i'm great at or that I excel at, I should say. And then I delegate the other things and that's okay. It doesn't, I don't have to be great at everything in order to be a good filmmaker. Ooh, that's such a good advice. Teamwork. I, I think that- Teamwork made the yeah, dream work. It's true. And uh, you need a team to craft one. Quick little plug there. Um, but I feel like as an early screenwriter, why, like I have that fear of the rewrite too. Um, and I think it's because the expectation is that like, oh, this has to be the good one versus mm-hmm. like the first one, you're like, it's okay, this is shit. No one's expecting me to, you know, have this like beautiful script from from the get go. But then when you're like, the, the, the bar is higher with every rewrite. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I got to solve all my problems in my script in this next draft. Like that's, there's so much pressure you put on yourself. And yeah. I, I, I'm and trying I- to tell myself like, it's going to constantly evolve. It's never going to be done. I think that's great. And you know, we're bringing up something here, which is like, we're talking about just that first draft, you know, but from a larger creative process standpoint, I think forgiving yourself for the things that you might not be amazing at um, and in a career that's already so hard, maybe Mm -hmm. doubling down on the areas that you really are good at and finding partners to come in and help you with that is, I was very late to that game because I let my ego get involved. And I just felt like as an auteur, you have to be able to do everything because I saw, you know, Truffaut did it, so I should be able to do it, right? Um, and and I, I disabused myself of that notion after therapy and, and some medication. Um, but it, it took me a long time. And I, I think that, you know, if you're out there thinking, I can't do what Mark is doing. I can't structure that thing like he's doing. You know, I can't, I can't put together a good outline that quickly. You know, I would just say um, that's okay. 
maybe there's someone in your orbit who can be your creative producer who can help you with, or maybe you share story by credit with someone who did go to film school and is an ace at that standard plotting stuff. And you're more of a dreamer or likewise, you may be an ace at the plotting rails, but you find that like you need someone who does the deep dive into like strange creativity to give you more color. Like, don't be afraid to, to accept that as a limit in yourself um, and invite somebody in who can make you better. Mm hmm. Yeah, this is such a collaborative industry. Like, you don't go to set as the only person. Yeah, that's like, fine. Doing the yeah. job, so makes a lot of and sense. Those are my favorite people to work with. You know, and when I, yeah. as a, being as a producer, you know, when I find someone who comes in and and is not trying to puff up their chest and tell me they nailed mm -hmm. everything, but when they're honest with me and they're like, "I'm really awesome at X and Y," kind of suck at Z. I can do an yeah. R and an S every now and then with a partner. I'm like, "Oh, I'm dealing with a grown up here. I'm dealing with someone who mm -hmm. can slot in." Like that feels great. Yeah. Let's just announce our flaws in every conversation, y'all. That's what I've been Let's trying to say. Let's do people. it. Yes. <laughs> um, well, we're, Emily and I are going to drop off, um, but thank you for that lovely conversation. Uh, now I know, Emily, if I want to um, procrastinate, I will just make a baby because um, that will be a good yeah. excuse. Right? <laughs> um, but uh, we're going to bring on our first creator, Eliza Brueger, who seen Spark campaign for the short film Forgotten Lovers closed yesterday. So give her some some virtual claps uh, for that, and Emily and I will drop off. What's up, Eliza? Let's get you off of mute, kiddo. I think you're still stuck in mute somehow. Classic. It's been two years, and I still exactly no, on mute. <laughs> yeah. How's it going, my friend? It's going great. I'm so happy to be chatting with you. I'm such a huge fan of you and everything you and your brother do. Um, so. I'm just like well, fanning I'm over here. <laughs> really excited about um, you completing your crowdfunding campaign. You're on Thank your way. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm very excited too. I feel I can finally start thinking about creative stuff now. So yes, entering awesome. the fun phase. <laughs> yes. So, well, I wanted to ask you about. Um, it's kind of kind of what you have been talking about already mm -hmm. a little bit, um, but we're working on. Uh, when I'm in the daydreaming stage of a feature, I get really, really excited about the idea. And the idea feels so like pure and untouchable and perfect. Um, even maybe through the outlining process, I feel that way. And then once it comes to putting it on the paper, I get sort of paralyzed because I'm like, I'm going to ruin this, this idea yeah. and this exciting thing I have by writing it. Um, yes. So I was curious if you have that issue and how you kind of get past it. I do. I do have that issue. And, and a lot of the stuff I spoke to are are the ways in which I sort of navigate it, in particular, that speaking out into the dictaphone so that I don't have to look at myself sort of um, destroying the beauty of the idea that I had in my head, which uh, mm -hmm. it's never going to match the initial charm of when that idea comes to you. And I've come to accept that. And I look at it like a marriage, you know, and that you have the dating phase for the first month and nothing's better than that. It's beautiful. And then you start to discover people's flaws. All right. Mm -hmm. And then you got to go, Oh shit, am I still in this thing? I mean, am I committed? But then, you know, as someone who's been married for 20 years, I really can say this, like, once you come out the other side of that, you see the flaws, you ingest them, you accept them, you work with them. Then it's actually, in my opinion, kind of more beautiful than the initial dating phase. Cause it's real. It's got the flaws. Mm -hmm. It's got all your hard work in it. So it's really all about, you know, chugging through that second phase of the death of the dream of what you thought it would be and mm -hmm. accepting what it is that is coming to you. Um, and that is something I think we should touch on a little bit, which is sometimes your ideas start to change a little bit um, without you wanting them to. And I think you have to be willing to let go of what that initial bolt of inspiration was so that mm -hmm. you can follow it. I mean, a good example is I made these two um, found footage movies called Creep uh, for mm -hmm. Netflix. And I started shooting them with my friend and we thought that they were gonna be kind of sweet, awkward Craigslist encounters that ended with two guys becoming friends in the end. Mm -hmm. And it started getting darker and stranger and weirder. And we were like, we don't like horror movies. We don't wanna make a horror movie. And we were showing it to them. They're like, the movie is begging you to be a horror movie. You are not in control anymore. You have to uh -huh. follow your movie. And so I had to like, break my heart, relinquish the initial idea, and then go into something else. And it was the best thing that I ever could have done. So I think some malleability is also helpful in that process. But mm -hmm. the number one element for me um, is just if you just, and this is just logistically speaking, you know, if you can 
get that outline in shape for yourself. That's the easy, it's easier than getting um, a full script done. And once you have that outline of like, you know, just literally I write like the name of the scene with an underline on it and then a brief paragraph describing that scene for the 20 to 40 scenes in the movie. And then once you get that, you, you're kind of like just in checklist mode. You know, I got to show up, I got to write mm -hmm. four or five scenes every day and you can really like mark it off and like feel good and check things off. That is what helps me get through it as opposed to just like, this endless slog again in the, in the sea of infinite possibility. Right. That makes sense. It's nice to hear that there's room to, to like, you know, to stray from your initial idea. Cause I think I get it yeah. in my head, like, Oh, you know, I, uh, if, if I stray away, then I don't know what I'm actually doing. You know? Yeah. I love, I love the chase and you know, every filmmaker is different, you know, and some people do have that vision and they can see it and follow it through. I'm not, you know, I get mm -hmm. kernels of good things and I have to kind of follow and, and chase a little bit. And the more I try to strangle the idea and hang on to what it once was, you know, the more I, I make bad art, honestly. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. Very cool. Cool, man. <laughs> is, is that kind of an experience you had with, with language lessons since it was sort of a COVID film? Did you, you have to adjust as you went with it? Yeah, it was really interesting. You know, language lessons, we we shot that in four days. It was shot mostly off wow. of an outline. Um, but we also spent a lot of time talking about our characters, spent a lot of time building the outline. I say a lot of times, maybe four weeks or so. Um, and um, and while the plotting of that movie never necessarily changed, um, the dynamics did. Um, and, you know, since you are a filmmaker who's going to be going to make your movie, you know, we shot that movie in sequential order and that really helped us to sort of dial in those small interpersonal dynamics um, by knowing what we shot the next day and just building upon it as we went. And so, you know, there were things in the scripts, again, the plotting didn't change, but there were things where, oh, you know what? She was more um, defensive about this than we thought she was going to be in the scene. Mm. So he's going to be a little different. And wow, he was way more emotional about this one moment than we thought. Mm. And if we hadn't shot those in order, we wouldn't have been able to predict them. We would have messed up and, and it wouldn't have been right. So I, I highly recommend, you, you know, sometimes you can't shoot all your scenes in order because you're like, I have a supermarket for six hours and I need to shoot three different scenes in there. I get it but try to shoot the core emotional scenes in order for your okay. main characters so that you can track those little nuances. Cause mm -hmm. I find it very hard to predict how each one's going to come out and it's much easier just to follow what organically happened. Yeah. Especially if you're probably also acting in it. <laughs> yes. A hundred percent. Yeah. 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 Well, cool. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Eliza, for joining us yes. and also congratulations. On yes. Thank you. Congrats and good so luck with your movie. Exciting. Thank you so much. Thank you all. I really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. And now let's bring on our final creator, Blake Miller, whose Seed and Spark campaign for the documentary, The City of Dried Fountains, recently closed with the green light for funding. Blake! How are you doing? Hello, Mark. How are you? I'm good, man. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for, for doing this. Yeah, um, congrats. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, for some context for my question, because it's less technical and more kind of holistic. Um, I'm in the first, nearing the end of the first like decade of really seriously pursuing filmmaking. Um, made a lot of strides, had a lot of challenges. Um, and something I like to do with my favorite filmmakers is look, is look at the first 10 years of their career, just to get ideas and see what they were like, just because I find it really interesting. I love studying film too. Uh, and I was watching your short film Scrapple, which I watch all the time and I find it hilarious and I love it for many different reasons but one of the reasons I really love it is how it's written but particularly how it's structured because it's just it's like a verbal fight really mm -hmm. um and I just think it's great so with all that being said all that context for you uh, I was run wondering in your first 10 years of really seriously pursuing filmmaking yourself what was your personal biggest challenge when writing the first draft of a short film of a feature film of anything and how did you um, overcome that that's a great question. Um, 
I would say um, I was so caught up in trying to be prolific as a filmmaker and get work made and feeling like, God, I'm already turning 25 and I haven't made anything that I would often rush into making things um, before I had connected to something that I uniquely had to offer as an artist in terms of what I had to say. I don't totally regret that because I was getting some pragmatic skill sets along the way by making crappy $10 movies that no one should watch or um, I still, you know, I learned by those failures, but um, I would say the, the, the biggest hurdle for me um, was taking that time to really examine in myself what it is that I felt I uniquely had to offer, not the kinds of movies that I like watching, which I'm fans of, which I did a long time. I was like, I like the Coen brothers. So I'm going to go make some movies like the Coen brothers. And then I tried to do that. And I was like, those guys see every frame of their movie ahead of when it's shot. I'm not like that. I'm like an organic jazz musician who tries to find it. So that's wrong for me. Um, and, you know, what I always recommend to people is, you know, somewhere in a conversation you've had with a roommate or a loved one or a family member, you know, there was a 1.30, 2 in the morning conversation where you found yourself exhausted and probably confessing something horrific about yourself that you never would ever, ever talked about. And you found yourself cringing and giggling about it. Um, and that is your special stuff. That is who you are and what you have to offer. And I was kind of afraid of that stuff for a little while. Cause I thought that that made me self-indulgent or that I wouldn't be a good filmmaker if I could not tell a story outside of my own personal experience. But the big crack for me at that time was, allowing myself at a time when my filmmaking skills were relatively low and inexperienced to lean upon what I uniquely had to say and who I uniquely was for a couple of movies. This is John, Scrapple, The Puffy Chair, all those kinds of things. Um, and then through the making of those things, developing my filmmaking skills so that a couple of years later, I was actually a strong enough technician filmmaker to be able to tell stories outside of myself more and then to where I'm at now with a movie like language lessons which is like I'm kind of tired of myself um so I want to <laughs> I, I want to like tell stories in deep collaboration with someone who's very different than me and has a different life outlook um right and and use whatever skills I have to support them in that vision um and then they in turn will freshen up the type of work I'm making so I don't keep repeating myself as a 45 year old man. So it's been a really interesting journey from allowing what would, I would say traditionally be known as like deep self-indulgence early on, which I was afraid of, but to go into that um, mm -hmm. and use that as, you know, I just didn't realize it when I showed up at Sundance with those first movies, they're like, this is so fresh. I haven't seen this before. And I was like, how is this fresh? This is just what's going on in my head. And, well, I'm the only person who has that head. Um, so that was really like the big thing was like doing the doing the deep dive, you know. And then there are a couple more semantic and logistical things um, that I that I started to develop after my first short film went to Sundance, which were, you know, maintaining control of my career as much as I could. And Seed and Spark is going to be excellent for that. And all of you guys um, to to own all of the movies that I make so that I could have creative control. Um, but also more importantly, so I wouldn't have to wait for someone to green light my movies and I could continue to work as an artist. And, you know, I've looked back sometimes and I've thought, you know, like, yeah, maybe I could have taken a movie like the one I love with Elizabeth Moss and sold it to Fox and done it as a big movie. Yeah. So it was a high concept, but like, I'll never regret just taking something and making it and staying busy the whole time. And, and, you know, this is a little bit in the weeds, but I think this is important right now. Um, as you guys are, most of you on Seed and Spark and crowdfunding your projects, sometimes you can get caught up in this old model of like, well, what if I don't take my movie to Sundance and sell it for 10 times the profit? Like, it does, is that going to be good for my career? Because that doesn't really happen as much anymore. And that's true. That dream is kind of a little bit dead. Um, mm -hmm. But what I'm discovering now is like, and what I hope for all of you guys is, you do make some movies now that maybe they don't like the world on fire. You know, maybe they play, you know, 50 regional festivals. You make a ton of friends and community and you find another actor to be in your next movie and a financier for 10 grand to do it. And you're still struggling with a day job, but you make another one and you make another one. And then in five to 10 years, you're making movies that ideally are financially sustainable for you. 
But the cool part is you'll have all of these early movies that you own and their value once you become popular is going to escalate. So The Puffy Chair, which is this, this tiny little movie, is now extremely valuable because it's Mark and Jay Duplass's first movie. So don't feel bad if these early movies you're making, even if they're really good and they're not lighting on the world, you know, lighting the world on fire, they're going to have this collective value for you as you move on. And the history of our industry has shifted. The future is all about building a library of consistently good work so that 20, 30 years from now, when you're like, I'm tired of scrapping and making $42,000 a year trying to get by, you're going to have this collective library full of two independently made TV shows, 22 feature films, 16 shorts and an animated series. And that's going to be worth a lot because there's only going to be like two streaming services left, unfortunately. And they're going to need to license those libraries from everybody. And it's, and it's important, you know? So I, I do think embracing the business side of that is also very important. Awesome. Yeah. Drawing deep and just keeping ownership and just keep going. Is what I'm I think that's, I, I think that's, I think that's what it's all about, you know? And I think in general, like the more you can, expose yourself to yourself and have an incredible group of collaborative friends who will not yes man you and will really hit you hard and say, man, this is not it. This is not it. But that five seconds right here, that's gold. Take that and go make another movie. You know, that's been critical for me. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you, Mark. I super appreciate it. Cheers, man. Good luck with your doc. Thank you. Amazing. Yeah. In time today, Thank you to Eliza and Blake for those thoughtful questions. Our ASL interpreter, Gabe Gomez and the Sign Language Company, Julian Tech and Danny and Chat, and to our wonderful audience for watching and engaging at home for this discussion. One of the last comments I read was like someone saying that they were so pumped they have to go dance now. So <laughs> I love that. Um, and if, you enjoyed, if you enjoyed today's event and you can catch your next 30 minute mentor with filmmaker and also founding patron, Jason Reitman, Next, or two weeks from today, Wednesday, February 23rd, 1230 PT, 330 ET, and check out more of our events and workshops at seedandspark.com slash events. I hope everyone's extra inspired and less scared as hell to dive into their first drafts or their rewrites. Um, Emily, any, any last words? Mark, any last words? Yeah, I just, I have to sort of beat this drum, which is just that um, everything that we have been doing at Seed and Spark has been directly inspired by the work, resilience, and creativity of the filmmakers in our community. And the reason that we're able to garner the support of someone like Mark Duplass is actually because of you. Oh, I just got a cup of tea, y'all. The afternoon is going to be the best. Um, it's really, um, if you look in the comment section here, like this is the energy that drives everything forward. And Mark, if you're looking for a little bit of extra side therapy, like this comment section would not be a bad place to find I want it. it. I'm printing it <laughs> all out right now. The okay. comment okay. section you should read. That's right. The yeah. <laughs> comment section that's worth reading. Uh, tell Katie her baskets have been well admired. Um, Incredible. And, a lot of basket love in the chat. Yes. Yeah. And I love. just want to thank you and especially thank Gabe for bringing your incredible skills to this conversation and keeping up, which is incredible. Um, and uh, Mark, you're just uh, the best. I just really appreciate you. And thank you so much for your wisdom and your insights and your generosity with us and with this community. I love being here and I love working with you guys. And um, I just want to wish everyone out there who's watching um, some happy writing. And don't forget, take care of yourself. It's a long, long road and uh, you're going to find it. You mm -hmm. will. Happy writing doesn't have to be an oxymoron, y'all. Yes. So <laughs> go out there and do the work. Have a good week, everyone. Cheers, Thanks, everybody. Everyone. Take Bye. care. Bye-bye.